those. Absolutely. But your kids can get there, mm-hmm. you know? And then once we open them up, now once the emotional wounds are open, then it's a conversation of, okay, I want you guys to, to you know, close your eyes. And I'll do this with the kids sitting there. And I'll close your eyes. And I want you to go back to that time that he didn't show up. Or that time he beat you. Or that time you, you called and he didn't answer. Or remember that present that you got promised and you never got? Hey, think about that time you just sat in your room for no reason as a young man and you just cried. Hey, think about how many times you told somebody, you're not my father. Think about that. And just give them a moment. And you will just watch the tears flow. Because it is, it is heartbreaking. Uh, for men to go back and revisit those times, but it's so deep-rooted and seated in them that if they've allowed it to become part of their everyday nature, and that's why it's so easy for them to abandon their own kids because that hurt just festers, and that pain just festers, and I understand if I rip off this wound, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reveal some ugly stuff. Uh, so that's one of the techniques we use. We use the kids to open up the emotional wounds of the fathers, and then once you're in there, you're in there. You know, you just have to really set the tone and let them heal and let them purge uh, that pain out of them. And what I've noticed through doing that is when, even before one session is over with, the way that they even hug their kids before they walk out the room is, is it, it'll make any tough guy cry. Because it went from, oh, hey, I'm here with Junior, to, no, I need to remain with him. I can't believe I've been letting this child experience the same pain I've been experiencing. Uh, and it really make it personal for them. Uh, and I will ask the kids to, to reconfirm uh, what their parents said. So how did you feel, you know, when the kids are, well, I was really sad that my dad didn't come, but um, sometimes, you know, you have kids saying, well, he's here today, but I won't see my dad for uh, of my next birthday. You'll hear things like that, and it really puts the fathers wow. uh, really on front street. So uh, using the kids as a, as a smart weapon, as a strategic weapon to get the parents to, to hold themselves accountable, and then once you get those emotional wounds open via the children, allow those men to purge. And once they purge, you build kinships, you build bonds, because it's a very emotional and vulnerable state that they're in and so the people that they now entrusted with that part of them they build a relationship with and they they start building accountability partners on their own you don't have to you don't even have to do it they just do it accountability partners are formed you start seeing dads taking their kids out together hanging out they they, they come to school when they drop them off they're, they're dressed a little bit better uh, they get make sure to get their kids to school early. They start all of a sudden showing up in the principal's office, you know, just asking and checking on the kids, sitting in classrooms. It really gets them going. Um, and so that's step one. Step two is when you have someone who is pushing for it and they're, they're, they're trying to be involved, give them tips and advice. Uh, and it seems more about finances, but it's really not. It's really about showing them that they have an ally. Uh, so, so one of the things I do is show a dad how to entertain a kid for $5 a day. And... You, you can, it's different ways you put it back on people. If you get that guy who's like, yeah, man, even five bucks can sometimes be challenging. I'm like, yeah, do you smoke cigarettes? Well, yeah, we're going to buy a pack of cigarettes today. Mm-hmm. Now, what's more important? Your, your, your fix or your kid? Oh, you, you enjoy a little marijuana from time to time? Cool, man. No problem. Don't buy something that week. What is that? 20 bucks? Okay, that's, that's, uh, you know, four days that you got five bucks now. You know, whatever you drink? Okay, cool. Don't have a drink that day or whatever the thing is. And we start eliminating, eliminating those excuses and show them how they can actually entertain their kids, and they become empowered with that. And what we normally see, or I normally see, is that you'll get a dad to go out with 5, 10, 15 bucks to entertain his kid, and the kid will remind the dad it's not about the money. So it's actually setting the kid up to be successful. So that's because that's one of the things that fathers believe. They believe if they can't financially support the kid, then it's easier just to abandon them. And that's been something that's been taught in our communities for a long time. That's why mothers get welfare if the father's not around. Then the moment dad shows up, he's not bringing as much as the welfare and the entire family suffers. So dads have been kind of systematically trained to remove themselves if they're not financially able of uh, giving a kid a certain level of life because they believe the government will do it instead. So they just stay away. But it's, it's teaching them like, no, you can come do this. And then the kids will always remind the parent it's not about the money because the kid understands. You know, you can take an eight, nine-year-old nowadays, man, they really understand what $5 is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they understand it's not much. Uh, but it's, it's, they'll, re, they'll remind that because the money will run out. You can only get a couple of cheeseburgers and uh, maybe a couple of bus tickets to the park. But what dad started to realize is, you know, my kid was really smiling because of the time that we were together. Not the gifts, not the cheeseburger. You only fed them just so they won't be yelling or hungry all day. But it's the fact that I was there. And they start seeing that time is the investment. 
So you start shattering all these these beliefs that the government has passed down or uh, that even other people have passed down or maybe even passed down to yourself. You start realizing that the child just needs you. And so then it reinforces to the dad that I am the value asset. It is not my income or my money. I should be able to feed my child and maybe clothe my child. Cool. But it's not that. It's really I am the value added asset. And you start seeing dads becoming empowered because they realize that they are the walking value, not what they have in their wallet. And once they realize that, then they become even more and more involved and more and more involved. So those are the first kind of two steps we, we trick them into getting involved. So use the kid as a weapon. Have them help you open up the emotional uh, barriers that are hidden. Help foster the emotional barriers. Uh, let that pain come out. Allow the father to process it. Allow them to build networks with the people that were vulnerable with them. And then teach them some of the tangible assets. And then when you do that, you can start breaking some of their own mental restraints about what they've been fed over the years and over decades to why they should, they're better off just staying away. And once you show them that they are the value added to the kid, then you start seeing the families and a generation start to heal from there. You really, um, and, and it, I was going to say, you're really doing family systems work there. I mean, that's, that's what I, I went to grad school for that. And you don't need to go to grad school for it. You're literally doing it. That's what we, that's what we're taught how to do in therapy, right? You're, you're connecting families by turning them toward each other and forcing intimacy. That's great. That's, that's awesome. Well, I mean, uh, um, professional is a very loose title. I mean, I (laughs) I see some some so-called professionals in my career that, uh, you know, I I don't know that I'd trust them. But, I mean, what you're doing is is amazing work. Hey, answer this for me because in my field, we really struggle to get people to attend things like what you just described, you know, groups. How do you get the dads to show up? How do you you connect with them and advertise them and get them motivated to commit to something like that? Because that's a pretty scary first step. Yeah, so uh, here's the trick. The gun is a carrot, right? So the beautiful thing about being a firearms instructor and, and, and putting out the gun videos and stuff like that is when we do an event, uh, sometimes the dads just, they believe themselves that it's going to be kind of gun-focused, and so they'll show up. Ah. And they're really there for the gun. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's they, they're like, oh, it's a gun dude. Like, yeah, come on in here. Walk on in. Um, and then also using my resources. See, I've noticed that you have a lot of people that do a lot of good things in different ways, right? And so I, I, I've, I've become a, a true fan of using other resources in the community. So if I work with, uh, say, three groups that do various things with children, right? And we, we all are doing great things just in different ways. I've taken it upon myself to reach out to them and say, hey, you know, uh, this is what I do. I see what you do. How can we work together? And then you start using the momentum from everybody to say, hey, we need everybody to show up. Uh, and if they don't show up after that, then I make the, I use the kids to make them feel bad. <laughs> I'll make sure that the, the, the school sends home pamphlets saying that, Dad, I just want to spend some time with you. You know, because, like, you got to trick the yeah. kids, too. If they get out of class for 30 minutes, the kid wants out of class for 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. So they're like, hey, you, yeah, yeah, I need you to show up. Dad, please. Look, they sent the letter. I just, please. You know, so you kind of use the kids, too. So uh, fellow peers, uh, kids, and the gun. But the gun is the secret. The gun is the secret sauce. It nice, really is. Nice work. It's the secret sauce. It's the carrot. That's awesome. So let's let's uh, let's uh transition a little bit to, to where you're um, – so you do the stuff with the dads. Um, and then, okay, that's class one. That, that sounds amazing. And I'm sure they get an amazing effect out of it. What happens in the follow-ups? How do you sustain so this? So the follow-ups, uh, we, I normally, so I work with a couple of different uh, Christian um, th- uh, therapists, psychologists. And so what I normally will do is specialize in families. I will normally set them up through, uh, whether it's fundraising, where we pay the first couple of co-payments. And I don't pawn them off, but I, at that point I realized that in order for this, everything that's been done to continue, it needs to be, it needs to be professionally monitored in a way. And there might be some pain that needs to come out that I probably couldn't, help them really process in a professional manner. So we link them up with a uh, professional uh, family therapist to kind of keep that thing going. And then I constantly do events. Uh, I'll say, hey, we're having this event at the range or I'm bringing, uh, we're doing free family firearms training or, hey, we're just doing it. We just did a barbecue at the park last year for no reason. And like everybody's invited. Uh, and so we, we try to do things that remind them of community while also making sure that they remain in touch with the professionals that can guide their family for years in the future. I just remain kind of an asset, a resource, and a sounding board if they need me going forward. 
for the attendance, is this are you targeting mostly uh, black men, or is this uh, all races? What's the demographic split there? Uh, I'll be honest with you. It started off just focusing on black men because I thought that was a black man. I had a unique black experience, and I was trying to help black people. <laughs> and that was me. At, that was me at sixteen. That's just how I processed it. Uh, but growing up, I realized, you know, early into my twenties, I was like, you know what, man, this is a this is an American problem. This isn't just a black problem. You know, you, uh, right. white kids go through the same thing. Hispanic kids go through the same thing. Asian kids go through the same thing. So now I just target everybody. I want any and everybody to come out. I think the, the stigma the, the stigma is, um, hey, it's a black dude, so he's only talking to black people. Now, that's just something society has done. Like, I didn't do that. Right. Uh, so we have to kind of break that. But the last class we had in Phoenix, um, the last statement for the truth that was in Phoenix was all white and Hispanic. It was great. Like, it was only two black people out of uh, almost 40. And so it was, it was good that you can start to see that some people are actually opening up. And we had, you know, the minority in that class was black and uh, Hispanics and uh, whites were the predominant uh, uh, races represented. So that was pretty cool. When, when do you, uh, like, when you go around the country, who invites you to these, to these different towns? Like, what's your connection? How do you, how do, you do it? Is it through gun ranges or is it through schools or what? Uh, it could be gun through ranges. It could be just peers, uh, social media um, followers would be like, hey. Um, I would love to have you in my city, and then I place responsibility on them. I'm like, yeah, okay, this is what I need. I need a building, and I need people to talk to. Help me promote it, and I'm on my way. Uh, so that's worked several times. Other times, it's uh, uh, peers. Sometimes it is, too. Now, my wife is a, a school uh, administrator, so sometimes it's reaching out to her and, and having her network uh, help me out and get out there. Uh, because of my work in law enforcement, I am uh, friendly with several police agencies throughout the country. So uh, just like I was in Riverside, California, it was a uh, a police associate of mine who ran an event out there dealing with law enforcement. So uh, he brought me out there and I spoke to law enforcement about the the dealings or the, the, the true issues with community and why the community is responding to them in certain ways and trying to help them fix their relationship. So it's all kind of different angles and viewpoints from different people. It could be law enforcement connections, uh, professional connections, uh, peer connections, social media. Um, I don't have a, theme, uh, a, a flow of resources in one market i kind of want that but i don't so i'm just constantly putting pressure on everybody to get me out there and they fund your uh, flight and hotel and meals and stuff or are you just dipping in your own pocket or how's that how's that covered sounds expensive uh depend, depends on the organization um uh, it depends on our situation but i will tell you for the first ugh, uh 10 years of doing this this is all 100 percent me so i've spent you know i'm pretty sure well over six figures uh doing this that's um whether it was just a passion of mine. Uh, now it is getting to the point to where, um, you know, I'm asking people like, hey, you know, let's fundraise. So I do have a, a GoFundMe. So I ask people if nothing else, just help drive uh, money to the GoFundMe. If your community doesn't have any money to bring me out, at least I can fundraise that way. Um, and But either way, I'm going to show up. If I make a commitment, I'll show up. I try to do it through fundraising, through donations. We are not a profit organization. So we're trying to get more and more people to just to help us out. It's working to be true grassroots. But... If an organization has money, and I know that, I will ask them to put the bill. And I'm asking that because our listening audience is really wide and um, diverse and quite varied geographically. And I, I will always want to be able to get people the opportunity to have you out, you know, if if they choose to. I mean, I, I'm i already deciding we need to bring you to Reno because I can plug you in with several different groups that could definitely stand to hear that message. Um I'm just my head is spinning right now, actually, and in a good way. <laughs> but uh, oh, that's good. Um, yeah, so uh, all right, so aiming for the truth is what we've been discussing. How it, does that have its own website? I can't remember. Is it Facebook or uh, what's aiming for the uh, truth? No, aiming they, for the truth. Is the, pretty much the, the best advertisement for it right now is just on the uh, GoFundMe. So GoFundMe forward slash aiming for the truth. And you can also just type Aiming for the Truth in in YouTube and see a lot of videos explaining it. Um, NRA did a, did a pretty good high polish segment on it, about eight minutes long, where they came and documented one of the events. So there are tons of videos out there on YouTube and uh, also the GoFundMe page. The only reason it doesn't have its own dedicated website is because I'm pretty sure you know websites aren't cheap to do yeah. it right. And it's, it's I mean, it's, the Aiming for the Truth has been up for three years. I think it's made just shy of $4,000 in three years. So... Uh, we just don't have the funds to do it. Yeah. Uh, so if you feel like kicking down, uh, do it because Kevin uses that money for 
uh, good. I want to hover for a second on the on the whole violence concept because you touched on that earlier that um, rather than focusing on the tool, uh, and I'm not a big fan of the adjective that precedes a thing. Like, so we talk about justice. I think justice should be justice. Um, but then we get into uh, criminal. 